Hi, my name is Brian Bohm. I'm president of Network Consulting Services Incorporated. Welcome to our video series on data security. Over the next few videos that we do, we're going to discuss a lot of the concerns that we've learned over the last number of years from our experience in dealing with a highly regulated environment such as healthcare and finance. Even though the information that we're going to discuss has application in the retail world, manufacturing world, etc., a lot of the concerns for uh, how we approach data security have been driven a lot by compliance and regulations. So the highly regulated environments tend to have a little bit more application for the concepts that we're talking about. Nevertheless, we're going to discuss a data security maturity model. In this data security maturity model, we're going to have a number of questions that we're going to answer. The first of which is going to be, where is my data? We need to discuss about where the data is located. Second of all, we're going to discuss who is accessing my data. Then we're going to ask, where is that data being accessed from? And then we're going to say, what are the people doing with my data? If we can answer these questions, then any security model, model that we put together will, in effect, become compliant. And that is our ultimate goal. Before we begin the discussion, I'd like to give you a little bit of background on where these topics have come from. In a highly regulated environment, we tend to find that most people are spending a lot of time in what we consider compliance-driven security. Now, what that means is in a highly regulated environment, a lot of the discussions we have, even at the C level and the director level, are, hey, we just had an audit and we failed an audit. And here are the results of the audit. Now we need to go specifically deal with audit question number one, audit question number two, audit question number three. Usually that results in product purchase number one, product purchase number two, product purchase number three. This is obviously not necessarily the best way to go about this. If you are in a compliance-driven security model, you will end up buying numerous tools that may not necessarily meet the needs that you have, or may have overlap, or may not have the training necessary inside your organization to use them. We tend to want to drive more towards what we call a security-driven compliance. In other words, if we can put all of the audit requirements off to the side and simply start with creating a security profile and a security plan for the organization, if that plan is tight and integrated and well uh, thought out, well designed, well implemented, and well trained, then the natural outcropping of that security design is going to be compliance to the audit requirements. Now I want to give you an example of what I'm talking about. This is a personal experience where this kind of was a revelation to me. Um, I've spent a lot of time in organizations having discussions about saying, well, let, let's put the audit requirements to the side. Let's put the audit requirements to the side. And that tended to be received very negatively, where people were saying, well, we can't. That's why we're here. That's why we're talking. Here's an example from my personal life where I had a revelation. Um, I was lucky enough to grow up in an area where uh, Spanish was spoken in, uh, on a daily basis. So whether I wanted to learn it or not, I ended up spending a lot of time with my friends that were from Latin American countries, and I ended up picking up Spanish. Ended up learning it, became fluent in it. Well, I was pretty excited when my boys were growing up that they were starting to get an interest in taking Spanish in their Spanish classes. Uh, and so they'd say, hey, Dad, can you help us with our homework? And I'm thinking, oh, finally, this is going to be an easy A for these guys. And uh, so while we're studying around the kitchen table, one of my sons says, hey, Dad, can you help me conjugate this verb? So I said, oh, yeah, let's, let's talk about that. So I start going into how you conjugate verbs in Spanish. What's a regular verb? What's an irregular verb, etc." And my son says, no, 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 Dad, I need to know how to conjugate this verb. And I said, I know, we're getting there, we're getting there. Let's talk about how we conjugate verbs completely. And he kept getting more and more frustrated with me until he finally looked me in the eye and said, Dad, I don't want to learn Spanish. I want to learn how to pass this test. That was all he wanted to do. And I had this enormous epiphany saying, oh my gosh, that's exactly what I'm fighting. People don't want to create a tight security plan. They want to pass an audit. That's what we're doing. And if you're in a compliance-driven security world, your focus is how to pass the next audit, not is my data secure. So a lot of what we try to do in our data security maturity models now is drive people to an understanding that getting a secure environment is the ultimate goal. Passing the audits is a natural outcropping of having a tight security maturity model.
Okay, so now we understand that having security-driven compliance is really kind of our ultimate goal. Let's take a look at how we actually got to where we are. If you look at the last four decades of computer technologies and security, we've spent a lot of time under the false impression that the bad guys that are trying to get into our data are actually outside our network. There's entire organizations that have spent uh, their, the, the structures of the corporations on building bigger perimeter protections. Let's put bigger, better antivirus on our endpoints. Let's get bigger firewalls. Let's get bigger intrusion prevention scenarios. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that these aren't important, but I do believe that what we're seeing in the industry, particularly with compliance-driven security, is that people are paying too much attention to the perimeter and not enough attention to the, the data itself. If you look at where our real concerns are in a data security model, we're looking at what the bad guys want to get their hands on. They really don't care about the laptop. They don't care about the firewall. They don't care about the web server itself with some minor exceptions. The end result that they want is the data. That's where the focus is. If they don't get the data, it is an unsuccessful hack, or at least prevent access to the data. It's an unsuccessful hack. So what we need to do is start moving our models away from how do we create a bigger perimeter and more into how do we protect our data. And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about in this. If you can picture this as, uh, let's go back to medieval times. You can picture this as a castle, okay? The king has his jewels in the crown jewel room. That's where he puts all in the treasure room. And what he does to protect those is he builds a castle around the treasure room, really high walls, puts archers on the walls, gets a giant drawbridge, puts a moat around the castle, maybe buys a dragon, you know, puts a giant dragon. He's going to protect so that none of these bad guys can come in and steal his jewels. In the meantime, it's possible for the cook in the kitchen to go up two floors, stuff his pockets full of jewels, and walk out the front door. And what the king does is said, holy cow, I've, you know, my jewels have been stolen. Let me get two dragons. You know, let me get three dragons or a bigger moat or whatever the situation is to create a bigger perimeter. Because this is what we understand. We've got three decades of, of creating firewalls. We've got three decades of antivirus. We've got three decades of intrusion prevention. But we have very little attention to uh, been, being paid, very little budget, very little money protecting the actual data itself. How do we start by taking our focus away from the perimeter and stop believing that the bad guys are outside our network and just start treating the data as our core concern? That is our crown jewel. Now, in the video series you're going to see coming up, we're going to deal very specifically with four questions. These four questions are, where is my data? Who is accessing my data? Where are they accessing my data from? And what are they doing with it? Now, in a true data security maturity model, if we can't answer those questions, it really doesn't matter whether we're paying money for better antivirus or for getting a bigger firewall. If we cannot answer those questions, we need to reevaluate our entire data security model.